no one will say to me what I just told you. No one will say Africa is the poorest region in the world today because it is the most overregulated region in the world. It is a place in the world where it's hardest for any entrepreneurs to do business, period. I don't hear anyone saying it. And you tell me how, if you don't have a right diagnosis, how you get to the right solution. Hello, my lovely win winners. Today I am speaking to Magat Wade. Magat is a serial entrepreneur on a mission to help her home continent of Africa. She's a well known speaker and author, but she's probably best known for her various Senegalese businesses, including Adina Drinks, Tiosin, and Skin is Skin skincare line. And it's from this spirit of entrepreneurship that her core philosophy arises that what Africa really needs is to harness the power of the free market to achieve the economic status that it truly deserves. And I really love this conversation because it challenged a lot of the preconceived notions I had on the topic. So on that note, here's my gut, Wade. So my gut, like I want to start by understanding why it is that Africa has, I mean, it's not just a reputation, it's, it seems to be mm-hmm. true that mm-hmm. it is the poor, by far the poorest continent mm-hmm. on earth. Mm-hmm. 17 out of 25 of the world's lowest GDP per capita countries are mm-hmm. sub-Saharan Africa. Mm-hmm. Over 50% of the world's extreme poor live there. Mm-hmm. And by extreme poor, that's defined as less than $1.9 a day. A day yeah. Conventional wisdom seems to say it's purely a result of uh, uh, colonization, um, lack of education, but your thesis seems to be something quite different. So mm-hmm. could you explain mm-hmm. what, what are the various factors that are contributing to this? So the way I would answer that, Liv, and by the way, completely true. I think most people do not like to hear, like even today, many Africans, you say Africa is the poorest region in the world, and then there's like all screams and cries. Why, why, why are you saying that? We're the richest... Because it's true, there is a little paradox there. You know, mm. this is the, um, the poorest region in the world, yet uh, in so many other measures, the one of the richest, you know, um, continent uh, regions in the world. And there, what I'm talking about is our um, population, first of all, right? Mm-hmm. And then there, right there, I will say it's a, it's a, it's a plus, but that plus, if not managed properly, will be our, our demise. And not just the demise of Africans, but of the whole world, <laughs> Right. Well, some of us like to say that it's, um, it can be a ticking bomb. In what way? Uh, we're talking about Africa is the youngest population, um, has the youngest population in the world, average age of 19 years old. And also by 2050, uh, one out of every four people walking this earth will be African. So usually when I say that, I like to stop because I think most people, once their brain catches up with what I said, and they're like, wait, what? And you realize most people don't know this. And so when you say the future will be African, yes, it will be African. And uh, I think it was Noah Smith, he posted, he reposted something that he had a long time ago today um, saying that basically any uh, futurism is Afrofuturism because... It's just because of the sheer dividend, um, uh, um, human capital dividend. So the reason why I say uh, it can be a blessing or it could be a curse, uh, and um, it's horrible for me to say of any human being that it could be a curse, but what I mean by that is if you have this continent being the youngest and going to be also uh, the place where most people, a quarter of the world's population will come from, that's a blessing till now. Until you say, and they remain the poorest in the world. You and I know that those two together is not going to bode well. Right. It's already not boding well. That's what I mean by it's, uh, we have a ticking bomb in our hands if nothing is done. Good news is plenty can be done. And that's why I'm so bullish on Africa. Plenty can be done. Um, so the, the Africa paradox, poorest region in the world, yet uh, um, so rich in its human capital, so rich in terms of having young people, a lot of them, as well as under the ground, you also have a lot, right? Huge land mass. Land mass. Very diverse. Diverse. Natural resources. Natural resources. I mean, the place is just like, wherever you look, it's just like, are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you. This is for real. So that's the paradox. And uh, so for me, the way, the best way to answer your question is I'm just going to walk you through what my own journey has been, because I had that same question. So just to walk you back, I was born in Senegal, west coast of Africa. And then right after I was done breastfeeding around age two, 
my family did what so many African families, uh, my parents did what so many African parents did before them and continue to do to this day. They made the painful decision that we're going to have to leave our daughter behind. That must be so difficult. I think people who don't go through this have no idea. And eventually, a few years later, they called back for me. And what you have to understand is, even though they were able to immigrate, to emigrate under safe circumstances, that's not the way for many people. To this day, Lev, um, you open, you look at Senegalese news, and you're going to see a boat just uh, tipped over somewhere between Senegal and uh, probably the coast of Spain or somewhere in Italy. For many people, that's how it ends. And you're in the, at the bottom of the ocean serving us fish food. So this is the reality for many of them. And sometimes people would hide in the landing gear of planes and somewhere above England, where right. you're from, the body drops. Yeah. So that's the level of desperation. Level of desperation. Going. And they know, for the most part, they know what, what, that these are not tiny chances of them not making it. These are like really almost 50-50. And yet, with all of that in mind, the people I talk to, the young people I talk to, the women I talk to who want to do this, they say, they look at you straight in the eyes and they say, I prefer death to the alternative. And they say, what type of life is that? That your mom needs help and you can't provide it for her and in nothing else, you're an extra mouth to feed. What type of life is that that your brothers and sisters, you watch them dying of diseases that no one should be dying of any longer? Mm. What sense of your utility on this earth do you have when you can't provide for yourself, let alone for those around you? And I think we would all feel the same way. At some point, what is life all about? Is it just about you come, you eat, you, you eat, you have fun, you know, you fuck and that's great? Really? what's the point of life? And I think for these people, it's really not lost on them. What's the point of life? They want to live productive lives. So then I, my parents moved, they emigrated, it worked out, and they called for me. So I arrived in Germany in the middle of the winter. I'm like, what the hell? And my what the hell was, it was not just the weather. The weather was, was weird. Don't take me wrong. But most importantly, Liv, what I saw was the first question that popped into my little girl's head, the little girl that I was, was, how come they have this and we don't? And you know, all I was talking about back then was, how come back home to take a shower, grandma has to get a charcoal stove going with mm. real coal, fan it. Takes forever. Yeah. Takes forever. Once finally it boils, she takes it, dumps it into a bigger bucket, mixes it with cold water, and then somebody stronger in the family drags it to the shower area. And there at last, some 45 minutes to an hour later, between the moment I decided that we need to take my shower and the shower happening, 45 minutes to an hour has happened. Here mom is saying, my God, time for your shower. And I'm like, I am not getting butt naked in this cold weather. Where is the <laughs> bucket of water? And she's like, come on, you silly. We don't have buckets here. And then I'm like, wait, what? jump in the shower, turn the knobs, the water's coming, temperature. I was like, whoa. No, literally, I was like, uh-uh, this can't be real. You know, it's almost like thinking like there's some, right. there's some, uh, some voodoo stuff going on here, you know. And yeah, yeah. And then, and then, you know, paved roads everywhere compared to back home, you know, sandy roads where your feet always become ashy. When you come home, you have to wash your feet, all that stuff. Life was just so cumbersome. And here, life felt just so easy. And I was just like, wow, how come they have this and we don't? And eventually the question became, how come some countries like mine are poor, while others like the US, like Switzerland, uh, New Zealand, Australia, all of those countries, how come they're rich? Japan. And I've heard it all. I've heard it all. I've heard people bringing up the IQ Fury. I heard people saying that... Uh, because we're savages who always fight each other. I heard people saying that, um, you know, um, they're just because they're stealing all of our re natural resources away from us. I heard people saying it's because of colonialism. I heard people saying it's because of racism. But you know why none of that made sense to me? It's because if any of that was true, how come, how come my parents, how come the minute they leave, all of a sudden they can manifest their greatest potential? Now I'm starting to think, the only variable in here is the place that they happen to be in or not. And then now I'm thinking that has to be with, 
this must be the place. After a couple of years, the family decides if we're going to stay in, in uh, Europe, which we're going to stay in Europe now, it's better for us to be in France because of many reasons. In this case, Senegal used to be a colony of France. Um, the French, French is the official language. Mm-hmm. So there's all of these ties for good or for bad. And then there, after business school in France, I decided that France was going to be too small for my ambitions. And I could literally have gone anywhere I wanted to to go by that time, because thanks to what my parents have done, they brought me to this place. Now I, I was a French citizen um, and all of that, which opened a world of possibilities for me. When you have a, that passport, a lot of things can happen for you. And I decided to pick the US when I could have picked any other country. I picked the US. And you know why? Because of Hollywood. That's exactly, you know, um, the Golden Gate Bridge, especially the Golden Gate Bridge sold me America. This is the one place I wanted to be in. I was so infatuated with San Francisco. I was so infatuated with those hills, with Alcatraz, with all. It was so wonderful. And also, ah, just, um, yeah, so I said, I want to go to America. And the movies have sold me the American dream, meaning in America, you can be anything you want. You know, it doesn't matter who you are. Like I felt in France. In France, I felt that, you know, me being this, the daughter of an immigrant, black African immigrant on women, all of that. There were, I knew already all the stacks would be against, stacked up against me, all the odds. Many of the odds would be stacked up against me. So I took off and I left and I came to the US and I was just like, it was everything and better than what the movies had, had sold me. In what way? The freedom that I sensed from the movie was even more in reality. And there I became a headhunter in finance, working for, you know, uh, finding talent for people, companies like Google, for Netflix before they became um, na- household name brands. And there at some point lived, something happened to me. Something happened one day, there I was doing extremely well for myself, having just bought a, a home in Los Altos. Emmanuel and I were doing extremely well. I think you know the Bay Area. So Los mm-hmm. Altos is one of the, you know, Los Altos Hills is one of the most expensive zip codes in America. And the reason why I bring it up is because to tell you how much I had loved, lived my American dream. Yet something happened. One day I was driving down Big Sur, which I tr- believe to be one of the most beautiful places on earth. Um, and I was feeling so good about myself. I was so f- feeling so good about everybody who has helped me make the journey. Gratitude all around. Gratitude and pride all around. But just like at any time I felt that way, the next second, it's almost like somebody would flip a switch in my head. Literally. I live my whole life like that. Um, so you go from gratitude, happiness, light, playing music, driving down Big Sur. And all of a sudden, it became dark. And what happened at that mo- what happened in that mo- those moments is that um, I would think about what I told you about earlier. About um, the people drowning at sea, the people falling off of airplanes, and the people being sold as slaves. And it would just... It would just be the most horrible thing. Um, but that day, something more happened. Because that day, I think, my body just jerked. The pain was so great. My body just jerked, jerked so badly that the steering wheel, I mean, normally I should be dead by now. I should not be talking to you right now, literally. It's only what happened is between me, God, and the elements that day. But you know, they say the mind has an infinite ability to make sense of pretty much anything, including of the worst. Mm-hmm. That's how I think some of us, you know, some people have been, we're Nazis and still, you know, justifying it. The mind has an amazing ability to do that, but the body doesn't. And I think that day my body decided to dissociate from my mind mm-hmm. because up till now, my mind would always, always come up with all the reasons why that was not my fault that was not my, 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 my cross to bear. The, Af- the Africa's That whole issues. thing. Yeah. That whole thing. And then I would walk out of that dark place. Slowly I would walk out of it because I would have washed myself off of it. Clean and square. Right. Thanks to my mind. Thanks to my mind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think that day what happened, my body's like, uh-uh. Caught up. Yeah. Yeah. We're not going for this madness. There's something wrong here. Time to address it. Exactly. And that's pretty much, I think, what happened. It was really the call. And um, because I happen to be a person of uh, faith and spirituality, I, 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 I'm, my only way out was surrendering. And I surrendered. I surrendered to God and I said, listen, I have no idea what I need to do. But from here on, I promise you, 
I am devoting the rest of whatever life you're going to uh, wish, uh, uh, you know, grant me to the betterment of this country of mine and by ricochet my, co my continent. And that's it. I don't know what to do, though, so you're going to have to help me. But I made the vow, and that was it. I got back in my car, I drove back, and I knew my life would be completely different from here on. And different it was, it became. Um, so that's what happened next is, um, so Manuel and I got married and everything, and uh, eventually I took him back home to Senegal, my home country. He's he was French, and I say was because we lost Emmanuel um, shortly after that. And, um, and then when I got home, I started, you know, I got so mad because I looked around and this hibiscus drink I grew up with, you know, the bisap, it was disappearing. But for me, it was just like, you don't understand this drink disappearing. It's, it's a part of my identity, uh, my identity, cultural identity, because it's, the people of Senegal are known uh, for the teranga, since, uh, uh, the hospitality. And teranga is hospitality. That's what we're known for. And we have a juice to personify it. the bisap. When you go into any home, that's what you get greeted with. This hibiscus juice. Yes. Yeah, okay. And then now we were going and nobody was using it. And instead you come with trays full of Trey, Fanta, Pepsi, Cola. Oh, like all Western brands. Yes. Yes. Awful. <laughs> because, because for people like us, for, like I would say, for culturally, uh, traditionally culturally, um, um, you know, um, dominated cultures, for traditionally dominated cultures, we all share this trait of thinking that we're less than. And that our traditions and what is indigenous to us is not go as good as the West. And so, and it manifested right there. And when I asked for the hibiscus, my friends were making fun of me. Family members, friends, and they're like, oh girl, where have you been? Pretty much if you're anything or anybody, you show your status by serving these drinks. Mm. So <clears> you <throat> see these drinks. What I see, you see a tray with drinks. What I see is the tray of the world. Mm. The drinks in it, the brands that they are, these are the cultures of the world that matter. And I'm nowhere on this tray. My culture doesn't matter. And in fact, it is, I see it everywhere all the time. And so I was, I was upset with it because I'm like, on one end, my culture is dying. My people are dying on, our, on their way to go look for work because now there is, all is gone. And I'm supposed to be okay with this. So, and then my husband said, my God, this anger of yours, it's energy, but it's negative energy. Can you see if you can turn it around where it becomes inspiration, therefore, you know, it's positive energy and see if you can use that to, 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 to come up with a solution. And uh, between that and my father, who always taught us um, this mantra of criticize by creating. I love this phrase because it's, it's very win winny It's like, oh, you want to fix something? Build something new. The title, that's why your title resonates with me. And um, very much, right? So it's like criticize by creating. It's another... Um, it's a, it's, I think it's a, a line out of Star Wars. I can't remember which one. It's uh, don't, uh, don't kill what you hate, build what you love. That's right. right. That's right. It's a similar kind of that's so true. mantra. And that's an even better one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep using, I'm going to start using that one as well. Because this is one something that I try to, at least I try to use it as my guiding light. It's so important for me to always remember what is it that I am for rather than what, is, what it is that I am against. Right. It's okay to start with what you're against, but you never should stop there. Right. You need to... Move, move that energy into creating something new. Exactly. And this is the inception of your first company then, right? Yes. Adina. Yes, Adina. It was just like, if I'm unhappy with this situation, I have to build a, a, a um, um, beverage brand that would be putting hibiscus back on the map. And um, we would do it in a way that we bring back these women to work. And at some point when the UNDP did a, a case study on us, uh, we were, at, I think, close to 4,000 women. It grew to 9,000 women that we brought back to work. But you know, Liv, while I was building that company, my answer started to, 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 to draw itself in the canvas. Of why, uh, the, answer, the answer to the question of why yes. is Africa struggling, okay? Because, so we had to have two sister companies and then a mother company. The mother company was uh, more Cayman based. And then you had sister company in the US and then the sister company uh, in Senegal. The sister company in Senegal was in charge of, uh, uh, you know, supply chain, uh, in charge of all of that part of, um, you know, the business. And then the one in the US was R&D, was, uh, was um, sales and uh, marketing, um, everything else. And... Um, it was interesting because back in those days, and we're talking about now, we're like in 2003, going on to 2004. That was the first one back then. Um, so quick to get your LLC going on the US side. So quick. Fill it out in no time. It depends on how quickly you type or you write. And uh, the application is done and uh, 
couple hundred dollars, maybe back then, if I think it was not even that much, was mm-hmm. 100 or 150 dollars. Trivial. You're done. Yeah. Trivial. Something yeah. trivial. Compare that to the one in, the, in, in, in Senegal, almost two years back then. Almost two years wait, wait, wait. To, to legally two register. Mm-hmm. Yes. And we're not even some of the worst. We were not even some of the worst. So today, oh, well, I actually have some stats here. Of, yeah. Uh, <laughs> of, in d- researching this, it's crazy. <laughs> it's insane. So to create a business in the Central African Republic, it takes 17 documents, 55 days, and about 5K, uh, sorry, 5K container yeah. per container to per import container. goods. Yeah. In Angola, you must undertake 44 procedures retiring, uh, requiring 1,296 days, which is 3.5 years, <laughs> yeah. to enforce a contract. And the, that process will cost 44% of the claim. Eritrea to to start a legal business takes 84 days and 94% of average income per capita in paid in capital to start yeah. a business. Yeah. That's in like it's in how why would you ever start a business? It's Thank just you. not only could you but why like it sounds horrific. You might as well go and do something illegal. So there you go. And so as I was um doing all of that and I was observing all of this for my, the first reaction for me was like of course you know Again, America is a rich nation. Africa is a poor continent. Of course, things are going to be um, easy here because we're rich and hard there because we're poor. Just come to understand live. No, 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 girl. Come on. Because in between, I had to make a very simple math that I think most people don't make because it's so simple. And it was, you're poor because you don't have enough money, at least not enough money to take care of your basic needs. You don't have enough money because you don't have a source of income. And where, what is a source of income for most of us? A job. A job. Where do jobs come from? A marketplace. Yeah. yeah. Then don't you think, but then if you told me that the poverty that we just talked about is solved by these jobs that come from these companies, but just two seconds ago you told me, oh my God, it's so hard to do business here. It's so hard to build a business here. So actually it comes from the regulatory environment. Yeah. So I, I, that was the aha moment because I was just like, if a poverty is solved by these jobs that come from companies, yet we, you told me that here it is easy for companies to be built, but here it is hard for companies to be built, then of course, the places where it's easy for companies to be built are going to be rich, and the places where it's hard for companies to be built are going to be poor. Hello? da. So would you say this is the, the regulatory environment is the primary cause of why Africa is lagging behind? What we're talking about here is the business environment. These are all the rules and regulations that are in place uh, in this country, in every country. The rules of the game. The basically. rules of the game. Thank you. So if here the rules of the game make it so near impossible for you to enter the game, then many, most people are not going to want to enter the game. You said it yourself. Why bother with this? When I looked there, I was, like, I was shocked. Because it is not something that most people were talking about <clears throat> to this day. They're not talking about it because to this day, you line up 100 people live. 100 people. Line up 100 Africans here, line up 100 non-Africans here. Usually they fit into two groups, same usual groups. The Africans and their allies and their non-African allies. You ask them, why is Africa poor today? Why is Africa poor today? Why is Africa poor, the poorest region in the world in 2024? Because we just got into 2024. Most Africans and their allies will come up with the usual suspects that that side would come up with. Colonialism, slavery, they're stealing on natural resources, racism, yada, 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 yada. The non-Africans who are not allies of Africans would tend to be, or have no compassion or whatever, would tend to say, IQ, low IQ, they fight all the time, they're lazy, they're crooks. And both sides would also say bad leaders, bad governance, we we'll talk about all of that stuff. But do you know what I don't hear from either side? No one will say to me what I just told you. No one will say Africa is the poorest region in the world today because it is the most of a regulated region in the world. It is a place in the world where it's hardest for any entrepreneurs to do business. Period. I don't hear anyone saying it. And you tell me how, if you don't have a right diagnosis, how you get to the right solution. The next question is, is why has that mm-hmm. happened? What happened is towards the end of colonization in most African nations that were colonized and uh, the Ghana went first in 57, but in the late 50s, early 60s, you had this wave of um, independences happening on African nations. Yep. And so, but what happened is before that happened, before the end of colonialism happened, 
you were have you were having Gandhi who was doing such great strides you know like here you have you had this uh, the biggest uh, the, the, um, the biggest colonized nation on earth about to be freed from the biggest colonizer on earth great britain and and um i mean there was a there was a, a wind of uh, hope optimism going on in the world of uh, the colonized you right. know and the africans search surely were watching as well and then you had these people who would become what we call together the the the, 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 the liberators of africa you know these are the ones who were also fighting for the, the liberation of these african nations and you had people like jomo Kenya you had Nyerere, Julius Nyerere, you know, of Tanzania. So all of those people were starting to bubble up. And But what happened is, I will teach you nothing to, when, if I say to you that back in those days, though, what was going on? You had these two great ideologies fighting with one another. On one side, represented by the West, you know, defending freedom and using capitalism as their economic system, facing off with various uh, statism, you know, from the Eastern Bloc, Right, and these two ideologies were fighting. So it was freedom on one end and statism on the other end. Uh, this one was using was using capitalism as its uh, economic system, and these guys were using various um, forms of control Socialism, control systems for yeah. their economic systems. And but they were f fighting, and uh, usually what happens is you ideologies fight for influence, and they were looking for influence south. You know, look, looking down south um, to Central America, all the way to Latin America, Africa, all of that. And so us again, and this is easy for me to understand because put yourself in the in the in, put yourself in the in the shoes of these African liberators. Socialism, communism, those ideologies were on vogue. Most people were right. Academics, that. the academics were that. Um, we were being lied by the Soviet Union that you know that stuff worked. When we only found out later, it was not working. Plus, I imagine you were previously colonized countries were wanting to stick the middle finger up to their colonizers, and it's like, well, wait, if the UK are doing that thing, yes, let's not do that. So what happened is, here we are, our people are liberators who are fighting, they just came, we had come out of slavery, then colonialism, colonialism, we were just into it and about to come out of it, and uh, them saying, look, you guys, the West, are the ones who colonized us. And so surely, whatever it is that you're promoting, we're going to be against you. Also, this whole idea, this whole attitude of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right. So in this case, we're going to go side with uh, the Eastern Bloc and the ideologies they were pebbling. Let's become socialist. Exactly. So this is when we threw the baby out of the bathwater, in this case, capitalism, which, by the way, the capitalism part, which is an economic system. See, people also confuse capitalism with uh, a governance system. You know, the, the governance system doesn't have to be the same as your economic system. It mm. can be separated. And that's another problem that people have a hard time understanding. But anyways, when they threw the baby out with the bath water, in this case, capitalism was the baby. They threw it out with the bath water. Um, what happened there is that was in flagrant uh, denial and misunderstanding of our African uh, roots prior to, colonial, to, to slavery. Right. You actually say, you say in your book, uh, the... The, there was this common misconception that Africa was always a socialist place yes. because of this this concept yes. of Ubuntu. O Ubuntu, yes. Ubuntu, yes. But you then say, actually, that conflation was probably the worst thing that's ever happened to Africa. That's right. Uh, as bad as colonialism and slavery. Now, yes. that's a big statement. And I, and I stand by it. Can you explain what Ubuntu yes. is yes. and why it's not socialism? And yes. actually yes. why pre-colonialization, yes. it was actually a very market-driven place. Yes. So what Ubuntu is, is this um, African philosophy of I am because we are. So this very strong emphasis on the community, right? Um, where, because when you look at Africans, uh, we live very communal, it seems like a communal life. We, we rely on each other a lot. Uh, the community, it's a very strong sense of community. Uh, it's strong all about family. Yeah, units. community, yeah. family, exactly. And even beyond the family, it's like the community, your clan, all of that stuff. So we're very strong about that. Um, and people would think, you know, so when you look at it from that standpoint, you're thinking, aha, you collectivist. No, no, no. Remember, Capitalism is just an economic. Um, it's just an economic system. It's not like your social system. See, socially speaking, we're socialist. We're socially speaking, we're collectivist. Socially speaking, we're about the family, the community. But economically speaking, the way we made our money was capitalist. So you make your money this way, but then you spend it this way. You can be collectivist, socially speaking, 
But it doesn't have to be the economic system that you use. And in fact, free markets, free market, um, free market uh, capitalism can be can go hand in hand with uh, socialist uh, so sociability. Or so I don't know how you would say it like that. But this is something that people are struggling with. But where we need to make the differentiation is one is an economic system. And another one is a form maybe of governance or even h how you as a society want, want to operate. But it, has not, it doesn't have to do much with your economics. Mm -hmm. Because I like to say, I don't care. You want to distribute your money all you want, like, um, you know, the, the Scandinavian nations, fine. But first, somebody has to make the money. And there's one way to make money. One way, last time I checked. One way. So do whatever you want with the money you made. But there's, you got to make it first. Many Africans, they resent the idea of capitalism because for them... It goes against that identity of theirs that's very Ubuntu-like. And I say, I am Ubuntu like you are, but it has nothing to do with the way we make our money. And actually, George would show that um, when, they, when um, people made money in Africa pre-slavery, one third would, the person who made it decides to put it back into the community, mm. the other third to reinvest, and the other third to keep. That's what makes the most sense, actually, to me. So it's what people then do. They make their money in a capitalist way, yes. but how they then distribute it yes. Yes. is actually quite social. That's right. That's that, right. That seems like a very healthy balance. I would think. Yeah. I would think. So when you go back and you go back and you look at the work of people like uh, George, Professor George Ayite, a Ghanaian economist, uh, who really had the insight to look places where no one was looking at for his time, because in his time it was um, really... Um, it was not good to be not socialist. Everybody was going with a, with, a, with a pattern. And he's like, no, there's something at odd here. And, the, and when I asked him, when I said, Professor, why, why did you look there? When everybody was looking north, you're looking south. What, what, what's it? Are you just a contrarian? He's like, no, because, because everything I knew about our past, and he would like to argue that in his case, when he talked about the past of Africa, this is what he says. And I noticed most of us, the story of Africa starts with slavery. But no, no, no. We were there were people there before the white man ever set foot on the continent. Hundreds of thousands of years. <laughs> yes, you know what I mean? We can there, that. there were people there. And who were we? What were we doing? How were we operating? What's going on? And uh, eventually, you learn that uh, you know Africa. We had some of the most sophisticated, you know, trade trade routes in the world. Um, you know, there is definitely open open um, you know trade. Um, and then people, when they arrive at a, at, a, at a at a center where trade is happening, all of a sudden you have these insurers kind of being born out of nowhere. So to ensure the, the trade that's happening and then when the trade is over then everybody moves on. So it was a very sophisticated, sophisticated market. Sophisticated for that time. Yeah, market driven yes, market economy. Dri exactly. The chief, you find that in many societies the chief was just uh, basically a person in which uh, the people have um, entrusted. It's almost like uh, you are the safe, right? But anytime we're not happy with you we take back our stuff from you. It's not yours. So there was a form of democracy as well. Yes, yes. And better than democracy I would like to argue and this is going to be the topic of my next book this whole concept concept of critarchy, the law of the judges, rather than the law of the legislators. Critarchy? Yes, critarchy. Um, so critarchy, that's all it means. It means the law of the judges. So okay. it's the judges. So in, in many African uh, communities, especially this is very known, especially in um, with uh, the Somalis, if you read this book, The Law of the Somalis, I mean, that book is one of my favorite books. And um, that's the one that my next one is going to be building off of, because the gentleman who wrote it could not finish it, he died. He was a Dutch, um, a Dutch scholar married to a Somali woman and living in her clan on the land with her. So he totally got to understand a lot of these things. But anyway, in many African nations, as George also would show, um, you there is nothing to judge until there was a crime. So a court would only be formed once there is a crime. Mm. And every crime has a price. And uh, this idea of jail, we did not know. Jail is, was not part of our thing. So if there's a price to pay, if you... You who committed the crime live, you could not pay for it, then your 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 family is gonna have to come up with it. If the family cannot come up with it, the clan come up with it. So there's a sort of self-enforcement mechanism. Oh, there's some yeah. strong incentives of to people, not mess around. Yeah, to like slap down any crime emerging in your community. That's right. And even better, um, when the, when a crime occurs, let's say you came, you stole a cow from me, that's a crime. And I'm, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to educate this thing, right? So what happens there is now a court is gonna have to be formed. To, to educate this case. And guess what? The beauty of it is that both you and I are going to be nominating the judge. 
one judge, but it's going to be somebody that you said yes to and I said yes to. Mm. And it was such a big pride in the community f to be elected judge. So everybody right. is exerting the virtues. Everyone feels like you're fair. Exactly. Everybody now is working on the virtues on a regular basis to, on the virtues to be a good judge. So people are really out, are performing themselves to be fair because, and you're not, you're not going to vote for somebody that you know is going to be biased against you or whatever. So by definition, that judge we pick, you and I, we know it's going to be the most fair to both of us. And see, these are how we were doing things. So that's why I like to argue that um, critarchy in my mind, especially if we can find a way to upgrade it. And that's, my, that's the next book I'm going to work on. It sounds like a very bottom-up yes. form of yes. justice and legal governance. Yes. I would like to revive critarchy, updated for 21st century, where uh, the, the rights of the minorities, especially women and men, uh, women and children, is going to be more respected. Right. So, and all, and all types of other minorities. So that's the one thing I'm working. That's the one piece that I have to get right. But then everything else in my mind is so. And if you, if we can get that piece added to what Critarchy traditionally was, then we come up with something that in my mind is going to be superior to democracy as we know it. Mm. Because we, we can all see that democracy has shown its limits. This democracy winner takes all. I we all agree that this is better than anything else we have had so far. But I, for me, it's showing its limits. So yeah, that's that's definitely goes against a lot of intuitions, I guess. You know, the the image that gets pushed to someone like me growing up in the West who knows very little about Africa, where it's like kind of there's it's strong men and that there's these power maximizers who control everything. But it sounds and, and that was what it was always like, but it sounds like that wasn't the case. It wasn't. At it all. wasn't. It wasn't because then what happened power is, is actually quite decentralized exactly. and fluid. You got the right word. It was completely decentralized and it was fluid, so, which means it could adapt. To its time and Which to sounds the like a very healthy system. Thank you very much. So that's yeah. why my goal is to bring this back. But right. I got to figure out the minority things. And then one more thing about that is also, um, so it's when they came, the colonizers came, and they said, "Oh, look at these savages." The, for them, the right way, the right way to go, the right way of governance was to be centralized. Right. And Top when down. and when they did that, we went from tribes to tribalism because tribes are not mm. stupid. If you centralize the power and also we've had the money because we had all the money coming with it, then people are going to fight to control to control this. And if you don't control it, your tribe might be at risk. Right. And so you see all of a sudden how we went from these very decentralized tribes for the most part, maintaining the stable, peace. Maintaining yeah, the peace for the most part. I'm not saying they were not fighting. Fighting is everywhere. I mean, humans all across the ages fight. But um, for the most part, they knew how to maintain the peace because it's super decentralized. But it's when they brought this idea of centralization because they said it was a superior way. That destabilized the, They destabilized the everything. And to this day, in Somaliland and in Somalia, a lot of these issues you're seeing still goes back to that. And you find that the minute that they get their fingers out of it, things get better. And then when things get better, the international community comes back and saying, okay, now we're going to come and help them. When they come back, they bring that back with them. You know, a lot of people are fans of socialism. Mm -hmm. and But they often obviously see it through a Western lens. Mm -hmm. Explain to me, because you, you go into this quite extensively in your book, mm -hmm. why socialism specifically was so damaging for mm -hmm. these African nations, because mm -hmm. it, it wasn't just, it, it sounds like it's the combination of socialism plus this disruptive force of like, suddenly mm -hmm. centralized mm -hmm. control mechanisms. Mm -hmm. This is why when you say so many people, maybe your audience are going to be fans of socialism. And this is where I would love to have them in front of me, because they're going to have to tell me what do they A, mean by socialism? Because I have a hard time believing that anybody, if, if, they identified socialism to be the force that has killed so many millions of people around the world for them to still say, and we think it's a good system. It just has not been done right. I would like for them to tell me, I, I'm, I'm genuinely, genuinely curious, but I will tell you what, for me, what I talk about when I talk about socialism here, I talk about this, um, you know, this, this whole centralized controlled ways of the um, economics, right? And also this idea that um, everything needs to come from the top. I'm talking about all of it. I'm talking about uh, an environment that is not, doesn't allow for open trade, doesn't, open, doesn't allow for uh, open markets. That's more what I'm talking about. Yeah, because you actually talk about, uh, it was J.J. Rawlings? Yeah. And because actually it was, it was women that would 
create the markets. That's right. Often. That's right. right. They were called market women. To this day. To Set, this they day. were setting the prices and, and well, they weren't setting prices. The prices yeah. was emerged naturally yes. Yes. through trade. Yes. And he was so, J.J. Rollins was so dedicated to uh, socialist con- price controls. You know, you can't set the prices that he would literally bash their babies' heads in as punishment. So you, what you have to understand is a lot of these African liberators, by the way, were trained in the West during times when socialism was on vogue. No respectable intellectual was, non, was not socialist. All of them were, for the most part, socialist. So when you're living in times where the accepted uh, philosophy is X, it takes extraordinary people to go against the grain, right? So in this case, most of them were brought up in times when socialism was on vogue. And for the most part, they were also raised, uh, they were also trained abroad. That's another point that... Um, um, uh, Professor Aite made to me because I said, why? What happened to these people? He said, they just didn't know their history. They just didn't know <clears> who they were. They didn't know the culture. They didn't know their culture, if you think of it. And that made sense. And so, because if they knew, they would have known that in pre-slavery Africa, no chief would ever have dared to tell Liv or Magat, you get to sell bread, but this is how much, this is, this is the little amount of uh, profit you can make. If you make beyond that, we're gonna, you're going to be in trouble. The chief does not decide what you and I get to sell to each other. Do we sell to each other or not? What do we do? How much do we sell and how much profit? Never. No one would dare to do that. This was an import. This ideology was an import. And so for the socialism that makes it that, um, you know, that looks for um, equal outcomes. Because to me, that's really in the end, that's their, that's their big ends that justifies all the means, you know, because we all have to end up in the same place. So therefore, whatever it takes, because that's a moral way to be. And in the name, but the truth is, you and I, do you really, we don't want to be the same. We don't. I look at these fingers, none of them is the same height as the other, but they work together. And so my point is, so that's what happened. So these people brought these ideologies that were completely foreign to us. Completely foreign. And our people drank it. They drank the Kool-Aid. They didn't think. Because when, JK, when he was doing that, when Rollins was doing that, he was telling me right away he did not know to which people he belonged to in the first place. To this day, markets in, in Africa are dominated by women. See, that's another thing. Many African nations, many African societies were matrilineal, meaning the child would carry the name of the woman. The Amazons, many people think Amazons are these exotic ladies um, somewhere in the Amazons because of name. Do you know where the Amazons are from? Benin. Really? Yes, they were the first recorded, uh, I think maybe the only probably also, female army defending the king. That's what the Amazon says. I think the movie finally just came out. It's called uh, Women, Women Warrior or King War, War, whatever her name, the name of the movie is. That's what it is. So a lot of these things, we had it like that. So it's actually, so it's actually much more gender balanced or yes. ma- even matriarchal yes. societies were existing. Yes, yes. And like, then that and does then, not go with the narrative again. It's like it we, doesn't. we've fed, it's, it's patriarchy, patriarchy everywhere. We've, everywhere. Been, we've been fed so many crazy things. And then the other thing is also same thing. They came. The West, the, the West, especially some of our, you know, very Puritan for the most part. And they said to, to the right a social order between men and women is the men in front and the women in the back. Mm. They did that. They did that. Many societies, it's women who would own the land. This is things that people don't know. But, but, like, but for, that's why for me, us Africans have to really remember who we are and where we came from. And there's a lot of things about us that were right. So right here, I will, I will assert, this is my birthright to be a capitalist, to be an, and I would say it better, maybe a free market capitalist. Right. Well, because I'd love to get into the different types of capitalism that Mm -hmm. you would advocate for, you know, there are many different Mm -hmm. um, flavors Mm -hmm. of it. You've got like laissez-faire, state guided. Um, What form of capitalism would you like to see, for example, in Senegal? Or yes. like, what would your action plan for Senegal be? What I believe is no person left behind. And what I mean by that is as simple as everybody needs equal access to opportunity. What they do with that access, it's up to them. Right, because that, that phrase, no person left behind, has been co-opted I know. in some ways, I know, right? that's why I use it. In, into I know. not equal opportunity, but equal outcomes. And now we're getting back into the sort of downsides of socialism and communism, yeah, right? Yeah. The idea of leaving no one behind 
is a good thing. But the way you leave no one behind is providing everybody with equal access to opportunity. Again, what they make with it or don't, it's going to be up to them. But do we, should we all work super hard for as many of us to have access to the same opportunity? I think we should. Yeah. Should we help as many of us to make sense of that opportunity? I think we should. But I cannot walk the last mile for you. And that's where everything is, that last mile. I can give you everything you need. I can provide you with all the support, everything. But if you don't want it or don't want to show up for it, there's nothing else I can do. And this is where we need to agree. This is where my job stops and yours starts. And this is also where your responsibility is at. Mm. If we can have peace with that, I think we'll be better people. But this idea that um, equal outcome, so I don't agree with that. So because of that, because I care about equal access to opportunity, for me, we go back to the... the, the um, the environment. So, and this is something that takes me back to, you know, this conversation I was having, you know, with um, Vitalik about, you know, EA, the world of EA, uh, effective altruism for people who don't know what EA stands for. Um, I've, I've always had um, good inclinations toward the EA community because I always thought that bringing rationality into figuring out philanthropy was a good thing. Because I'm the first one to be upset with stupid philanthropy. And philanthropy can be but very plenty stupid. <laughs> plenty stupid, exactly. <laughs> so I was like, thank God we have people who are going to use, you know, their mind as well to, co- to work together with the heart and, you know, get us to, to a better place. But I think, you know, when that happened, where for me, you know, I'm definitely solidly in that camp of EA, but where EA kind of lost me was with the fact that I felt, um, but I'm like, okay, can we push the thinking further down? Do we have to stick at the, the social fact of somebody is poor, so it's a matter of us thinking about what we're going to give them and how we're going to give it to them and make sure it's done in a way that's going to be effective. How about we push the envelope further along and say, but do people really have to be given things? Or can we not trust the fact that given the right circumstances, and that's a key word, circumstances, they too can lift themselves out of poverty. Or do we believe that they just need to be given? Well, interestingly, some, some of the most cost-effective um, and therefore you know, impactful interventions have trended towards being things like cash transfers or startup loans, yeah. which is, okay, yes, it's not quite changing the system from the outset, but it, it, it's one layer above that. It's giving, identifying promising communities and giving them an influx of essentially capital, which that's they right. can then deploy. That's right. So that's a, fo- it's still a form of charity, right? Because it's sending, it's sending money with sort of minimal strings but attached. It's protect- but it's productive. It's way more productive than what was there before. Because, totally. because when you're doing that, when you're doing that, you are, you are doing a part, you're doing a part of uh, what is what I call the, the entrepreneur's toolkit. If indeed, as remember when we said, poverty solved by jobs, jobs coming from companies, businesses, but those businesses need a right environment. When you call that whole business environment, all of the stuff that goes into it is what the economists would call economic freedom. Mm -hmm. And in economic freedom, you would also have, you know, access to capital, access to investment. But that's not all. You, You need that, but that's actually going to happen better and go further if you have everything else to be right as well. We're talking about rule of law. We're talking about clear and transferable property rights. We're talking about, um, you know, people understanding what the law is and also trusting that it's cases will be educated in a fair, quick and cheap way. All of that stuff has to happen. So, so when you're saying we're going to provide you with capital, that's more than what was there before, for sure. And it's definitely part of the entrepreneur's toolkit because we need to, 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 to liberate those entrepreneurs so they can create all the wealth we talk about, we're talking about. So when you're doing that, you're doing better than before. But still, you need to go deeper. where's the environment? Exactly. It sounds like you're saying the most effective thing that could be done is creating, again, changing the rules of the game, creating... Thank you. The, the, creating a soil that yes. is fertile enough in terms of minimal regulation, right. the right amount of regulation right. to enable little community, things yes. to actually grow, entrepreneurs, yeah. to allow intellectual capital to actually do exactly. its thing, giving people... Exactly. Uh, and I mean, I would completely agree with you. And I think that's a fair critique of not just effective altruism, but all forms of philanthropy and that it probably doesn't go deep enough to that systemic layer. I would say that 
at least I can't, again, speak for other forms of mm -hmm. philanthropy, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the charities, the effective altruism charities I've donated to, like Against Malaria Foundation, mm -hmm. Give Directly, mm -hmm. those kind of charities, they've never claimed that they are trying to f do a systemic change. That's yeah. not their expertise. That's right. They're just like, this we don't know how to go in and change a system that like that's probably an overreach yeah. someone should do that yeah um th those problems th this is the best way in the current s system to try and that's right. help help lives that's right now like doesn't stop anyone else coming in and trying to which is i guess what you're trying to do right you're yeah. trying to do the the systemic change right actually before we move on into into the systemic change uh -huh. and i think the different types of capitalism i'd uh -huh. love to get your thoughts on foreign aid because that's now that's a very different thing. It's technically a form of philanthropy. Yeah. But if we've talked about effective philanthropy, that's from what I can gather from the way you're rolling your eyes, <laughs> that's the most ineffective and possibly even net negative. Um, so can you explain why? Sure, sure. So foreign aid for people who might not be f uh, familiar with it. So first of all, before I even go into the whole thing of aid, I want to make it clear and I always make it clear, I, know, I don't have an issue with humanitarian aid. When disaster strikes, we all have to go and help, and that's just we we help like a first. Big earthquake we help, or yeah, exactly. Like we help first, yeah. and we talk later, right? We we don't ask questions. It's just like it's a no-brainer. So it's an never, yeah. exactly, never do I have an issue with that. But when it becomes chronic, then we have an issue. The fact that in Haiti we still have a people who are who are there, there, <clears> that's a whole other problem, and that's going to be into what we talk. So, foreign aid um, is government to government aid. So because, like we said earlier. You know, uh, towards the end of the, towards the end of colonialism in Africa, um, basically because of the African liberators, sorry, had drank. Did I tell you? Had drunken the socialist Kool Aid of their times. Most African nations, um, pretty much for all all of them, started out with uh, socialist uh, leaders. <laughs> having in place very socialist policies. Even the ones who would say, oh, no, no, we were not completely socialist like Nigeria or something. But I'm like, even you are following five-year a, a la Soviet style type of, uh, you know, top-down, um, you know, policies. So even there. And so that's kind of how we started on this, on this journey. And as we all know, you follow, you know, socialist policies. In the end, you don't have you don't have much to show in the in the form of wealth and prosperity that you have built. So, because we did that and we embraced this deadly ideology, we ended up where we are today. Meaning, sixty some plus years later, my country became, you know, free um, April fourth, nineteen sixty. So we're in it almost uh, sixty four years now. Soon, Senegal is one of the twenty five poorest countries in the world despite being one of the two countries in Africa that never had a coup, never had a civil war. And you could say that we were supposedly a beacon of democracy. So that's my other problem also with democracy, because so many people have been distracting us with making us think that democracy equals prosperity building. Is that a good thing to have democracy? For yeah. Is that a prerequisite? I think the Chinese model, all of those other models, right. it doesn't it's, mean it's, that I'm against it's it. It's a correlation, not necessarily yeah. a causation. Exactly. Yeah. doesn't mean that I'm against it. That's also what I want to make sure people don't hear. Oh, my God, is a, my God is into... No, no, that's not what I'm saying. But again, I feel like we've been distracted because, again, I think this whole... What you're asking me about is we've been distracted a long time. So anyway, so because we have been showing, um, we have had nothing to show for our socialist ways, our nations are still poor 60 some plus years after colonization because we have embraced socialism and never questioned it, by the way. That's why this book, The Heart of a Cheetah, we have to, re we have to question all of this. We have never questioned it. We take it for granted and we're trying to fix our problems within the social fact. Mm. So because of that happened, we're poor poorest region in the world. The rest of the world feels like it always has to help us. Foreign aid, government to government aid. So you could think, then people are like, why are you, why are you complaining about foreign aid? We're here helping you build your roads. We're building your hospitals, all of that stuff. I'm like, okay, lady. Because in this case, it was a lady that I had a fight with last time. So I'm like, okay, lady. I'm like, let's think about your foreign aid. Because you know, Liv, you know, life is all about trade-offs, right? Oh, so yeah. let, let, let us look at the trade-offs. So for your foreign aid, I get a few roads, but not even the best roads, because guess what? A road uh, that was supposed to mobilize, I'm just making up a number, $5 million to make a road if you want to do it right. It costs $5 million, but I know you only put $2 million in it because you stifled the free, of the three million. The other three million went half in the pocket of a corrupt leader mm. that you're dealing with, and the other half went through back straight back to you with all of your agencies that are serving also the foreign aid world. So we get 2 million, if we're lucky. The rest is separated between the leader of this country, corrupt leader of this country, this foreign nation, 
and the other comes straight back to Tokyo, comes straight back to Paris, comes straight back to uh, Washington, D.C., and so on and so forth. So actually, it's not really trickling down where it needs to be. No, it's just no, getting all no, siphoned no, off no, and, and exactly. squandered. For the crappy road, I guess what? I guess what? I get what? I get a leader that's never going to want to leave right. because he or she wants to stay to keep taking that money. Because remember we said $5 million road, $3 million is not accounted for. Mm -hmm. Some of that is in the pocket of that guy or that woman, oftentimes it's guys. And they're going to use that money to go buy chateaus in the south of France. They're going to have Swiss bank accounts. Uh, they're going to have all types of goodies like that. So, but because of that, because they want access and control of that foreign aid, they're going to fight. They're right, that's the thing. It's, if, if you've already got corruption, then foreign aid will actually Im entrench that corruption it further will. because it's just more and more power going to the people who are willing to do that. So that's one thing. People who never leave, so violence, the violence that that provokes. Then you also have a culture of dependency. Entire generations of Africans who learn that we're given stuff. For whom at some point, it's, 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 what's normal is not to work. What's mm. normal is to be given. What do you mean work? What do you mean? You can't have an entrepreneurial, you know, like society with a mindset like that. So you're robbing, you're, you're really... Robbing agency. Yes. And that's big. That one is big. It's right, big. That continues then down generations. It becomes a mindset. Exactly. It's very cancerous. Yeah. Exactly. And least but not least, because when you're doing all of this foreign aid and all of that, it's in a way covering the real problems. Mm. When you're doing all of this, no one is talking about the, clim the business climate. And then some people will say, oh, no, no, what are you talking about? During the uh, Washington consensus, you know, the, 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 the World Bank and others told the African nations that they're going to have to clean up, you know, their business environment a little bit. So, you know, because otherwise we're not going to give money. And you know what some, many of them did? They cut healthcare mm. and they cut education. They didn't cut their having one more mansion. They right. didn't cut having 20 million How much uh, spent girlfriends. on bureaucracy in general? Nothing. Yeah. They cut where they thought it would be the easiest to cut, which is the most ridiculous thing because... That's where actually I was needed. I mean, health and education are always going to be the last thing that I personally, and even as a bleeding heart libertarian, maybe because I'm a bleeding heart libertarian, that's the one thing where I argue with so many, um, you know, like libertarians because I'm like giving money to education and to health. I will never have a problem with that. Mm. Never, 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 never. Um, I argue that if there are ways it can be done better, I want, I want to, I want to help with the education of, of, of children, even if they're not mine. I want to make sure that a man or a woman or a child is, uh, is, is up, upright, not on the, on the bed. I want that. And if the only way to do it, it would be to, to donate, fine, let's donate. But I just want to make sure it's going to, effectively going to go to them and do what it's supposed to do, educate them and or give them, give them health. So because foreign aid covers all the problems, we're still not addressing the issue. And as long as the issue is not addressed, Africans stay poor. And guess what? Africans stay poor, Lev, does it, what does it mean? It means racism. Mm. My friend Remy Adekoya, he's in, in, a, in a England, he wrote this book that I think everybody should read. It's called, It's Not About, it's not about Whiteness, It's About Wealth. I believe that 80% of racism is due to the fact that Africa being home of 90% of a home to 90% of a representative of a black race skin color happens also to be the poorest in the world and that blackness has come to be linked to, to less than exactly right. the day we correct that the day we become prosperous I, I, I like to argue 80% of it is going to disappear. 80%. This is not to take lightly. And so, so, so for me, that's a, that's a worse one. In addition to just people living in poverty, which is the most indignified thing in the world. And the fourth one is neocolonialism. He who makes the gold makes the rules. There's this feeling of indebtedness. That mm -hmm. It keeps perpetuating that cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because you give me the money, so that's how the French, that's how the Americans, all of these people get to actually <sighs> decide even who we elect. Make no mistake, many Africans and their allies think, um, I'm African, but I'm not the type of African who thinks that way. So many Africans think that Africa is poor because uh, of neocolonization. They'll say, okay, coloniz colonization is done, but it's, we're, still we're still colonized, we're neocolonized, meaning like everybody's meddling with our affairs and everything, and or buying our resources for on the cheap. Like basically, we're, we're still neocolonized. Mm -hmm. 
And I say, make no mistake. We are neocolonized because we are poor. Because we are poor. We're not poor because we're neocolonized. Very different. They don't mm-hmm. think about it. And as long as we remain poor, the rest of the world will help themselves. Before we get into some of these solutions, mm-hmm. what's an example of foreign aid that you do support? Basically, the, the, only, the only forms of aid that I support is the form <laughs> is the aid that helps people be productive. Which actually brings back to almost like the type of give directly. Yes, I always support, like, you know, when some people are asking when something happened, even in um, when there is a disaster that strikes, I say try to support people on the ground. And this is my other thing with central, centralized versus decentralized. Local is always going to know better. And that's why I hate socialism as well. Local is always going to know better than the central planners. Right. It's just the nature of a beast. It's just a richer information landscape. That's it. That, yeah, and, you're going to have and, and, and higher feedback quality loop. information. Yeah, exactly. And feedback, feedback loop, loops, and the yeah. feedback loop is shorter and it's more important. So that's why socialism, who thinks it's everything comes top down compared to, you know, a free market capitalism where it comes from the bottom and bubbles up, the market intra- instructs us of mm. what is needed, when it's needed, how much is needed, where it needs to go and how it goes. So some people would argue that capitalism has, because... If I look around here in in America, I mean, even somewhere like here in Austin, mm-hmm. which is actually more, it has a sort of stronger religious vein mm-hmm. to it. And you know, there are a lot of churches around. Mm-hmm. And yet the, even here seems like it's losing that community feeling. And some would argue, and I wonder it myself, like, is that a result of sort of a, a, this very capitalist structure um, that has broke, broken down the strength of community? And I would worry that would that same thing then happen no, to Africa? I, no, I would argue the opposite. I would argue that the reason why we have gotten to where we are is not because of capitalism. It's actually because the state has been taking on more and more. Right. Because and robbing of, communities of their, exactly. uh, their cohesion. Exactly. Whether it's, it's um, through self, you know, self-enforcement. Yeah, because at first, when it was all of these mutual aid societies were more or less, you know, private because of church. It's all private, right? You're doing is people coming together, getting something together, a church, a mosque, or whatever, or just I don't know, like a women's a women's house for women. Um, what happened is the more the state takes that responsibility, the more it takes takes control of that. What happened is all of a sudden, live. If you're living in a in a community where you know. Are you, which church are you part of? Which mosque are you part of? Which synagogue are you part of? Which, um, which uh, you know, like temple are you part of? Whatever it is, or which group are you part of? You choose whichever works for you. And in a way, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to inspire you to be a good community person. Mm. Because in a way, you're down on your luck. You're going to depend on these people, right? If you're going to be a jerk to everybody... I'm sure people are probably going to try to help you for sure, because, you know, we all, we need to help sometimes no matter what. But, you know, you, you also sense that uh, in, in return, you also are going to be a little bit more community oriented. Also do your part, mm-hmm. do your part whenever you can. So that way, whenever you need, you can take out of a pot, but you also have to feed the pot, right? So you, you contribute. So, and that forces you in a way to be, to be part of a community and have that sense of community. Right? But now imagine now, the state takes it. Now you're like, I don't give a shit about any of you guys. Right. Why do I care about any of you? Because if I need something, I don't it care. Goes to them. Discri- indiscriminately, it's going to come down. Right. So this is not capitalism that did this. It's things actually becoming more socialized yes. through the state that it became this. Because all of a sudden now, you took away the incentive that this woman or this man or this child had to be a good community member. So one of the solutions you are strongly advocating for, uh, for Africa that harnesses the best bits of capitalism Mm -hmm. are sort of these startup or charter cities, Mm -hmm. they're sometimes known as special economic zones. Can you explain what those are? Yeah. And can perhaps give an example of one you'd like to see that is starting? So earlier when you were talking about capitalism, which type and all of that. So for me, I'm all about, um, you know, the only one that's worth worth anything is... uh, free market slash entrepreneurial capitalism. So that's the one where you have to build, you have to build, you have to grow the pot in order, you know, for it to work, not be a rent seeker because that's not capitalism by the way, that's crony capitalism. And I think it's important we bring that up because many people in the name of crony capitalism despise capitalism. Mm. Crony capitalism is this force by which you get to get ahead because you have friends in business, in, uh, in government especially, basically where the power is, government power especially. People who are setting the rules. Exactly. You can and influence. And you set them 
to influence, yeah. to, to help yourself. It's yeah. another form of corruption, basically. But too often, when people think of capitalism, they think of that. Yes. And I'm like, it's very important there again that we make the differentiation. Because capitalism is really about giving everybody a fighting chance. If you're an entrepreneur, I'm an entrepreneur. We don't have mommy and daddy, aka the state, using its power, which is the, re the rules and regulations, to kind of tweak them in a way that, oh, I want Liv to be the winner. So if uh, Liv is short, I'm going to make sure that, you know, <laughs> you know, play to her, play to whatever she... Right. Her, design her the, design the rules so that short people have a Yeah, have exactly. A or if Liv is but tall... But isn't, isn't this going to be inevitable? Is it going to try? Yes. Do we have to let it be? No. But the U.S. has really gone a very, very bad direction on this. Don't take me wrong. The U.S. is still one of the best countries to do business in the world to this day, despite mm -hmm. its problem. But the U.S. is going to have to catch itself. Right. Because it's, it's, it's really backtracking. Back, back, back tracking. So going back to so entrepreneurial capitalism, and also I want to say it, I'm a firm um, supporter of conscious capitalism. And the reason why I bring it up is because Can I you define that. Yeah. So conscious capitalism is basically this whole concept around prof, um, purpose maximization versus profit maximization. Right. For us, the relationship between uh, purpose and profit is just the relationship between, if I say live, what's your goal, your dream in the world? And I know you're going to tell me it's something that's going to be, you know, about, but something about changing the world, right? You want to change the world. Finding the win-wins. There yeah. you go. But in the no circumstances will you say, my goal is to build as many, to produce as many red blood cells as possible. <laughs> but you need, to, build, you need to, to produce them if you want to stay alive so you can do all of those big things. That's the only thing. That's the only really, so John Mackey says it's the best. Um, profit is to the, you, the human being with these big goals, what blood, the red blood cells, that's it. You gotta have them. You gotta produce them. They gotta be abundant. It's a metric, but not the metric. Exactly. It's not. It's not the end goal. If you don't have profits, you cannot sustain the whole machine. But it's not the end game. So purpose maximization over profit maximization. But what we have found is, if you go for purpose maximization, you tend to do better than those who don't care about purpose maximization. And it makes sense because for conscious capitalist, a business has six stakeholders, employees, um, your suppliers, your, uh, your, your um, customers. customers, Mother Earth mm -hmm. herself, as well as the community in which the business is working. And yes, your, sta your shareholders. And anytime you make a decision, it's got to be a win, 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 right. win between all, all six. The, the pushback is that the company that sacrifices a few of those will get the leg up. Like if they're the ones who, let's say, don't also make sure that Mother Earth wins because they can externalize the costs, you know, p some form of pollution, and that, thus, because they're kicking out those costs, they're not, they're not factoring them into their equation, they can put that money straight back into growing faster, arguably they would then get a leg, a leg up ahead of the ones who do the, like, the slow, more expensive things, such as taking care of Mother Earth. So that's where, I, that's where my internal struggle is. With, you know, I still describe myself as a capitalist, but like, that's what this Moloch problem is. Yeah. No, and I, it's a very good How point. How do we beat that? It's a very good point. And this is why us conscious capitalists, we like to say that we're all about value. It's about value. And what do we mean by value is, first of all, because what you described, you see, one is short-term looking, the other one is long-term looking. Mm -hmm. Many conscious capitalists, and that's why in a way, the, co the companies that can do this the best is a cap the companies where you still have a founder. That's why I have so much respect also for companies, you know, like uh, the Giga Fund, where it's explicitly, we're going after founders that are working on problems that are 20, 25 years down the road, right. you know, like, and Very we want, and we type. long view type, and we want these founders to be in the game for long, because we have found that actually those type of companies are better served by the original founder or the family. If it's a family, it's a family, it's a family company, like in, in, in Europe or whatever. We have found that it's much, it's just so much better. So this is why, um, and if you want to provide value, there is a, 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 con a, a connotation of time baked into this equation. And so this is also the, where our dialect, our con where the dialect is different. The words we use are very different. Uh, what we go after is very different. But it is known that in the long run, keyword, in the long run, 
we win. And this is also where we show where I, it's easier to be a conscious capitalist when you're a B 2 C, you know, business to consumer, direct to consumer, or business to consumer, where the consumer gets to definitely vote directly. So it's easier right, for it's Whole Foods. Feedback loops. Exactly. It's exactly. So it's easier for Whole Foods to win, for example, compared back in the days to a Walmart, because you get to see exactly what's happening, and um, you leave it to the market to communicate about what they're doing better than the other guys. It's 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 thanks actually to, <laughs> it's thanks actually to companies like Whole Foods Market who were way smaller than Walmart. Then actually Walmart became the biggest seller of organic cotton in the world. It's because once we started putting the emphasis on it and the consumer base started to realize, you know, these issues, then they started to vote with their dollars. So it's easier for them to vote with their dollars when they have a direct, like you said, a direct feedback loop and they know what's going on. And so traditionally for um, B2C, uh, you know, companies and brands, it's been much easier than, let's say, if you're buying, if you're um, patronizing a bank. Right. Because you don't necessarily know what they're going with a bank or even uh, your pension fu- your pension fund plan. You don't know where right. and who There's they're investing in. clear information it's, flows. Exactly, exactly. So because of that, all the things you're talking about is true. But I would argue that, again, this is, to me, this is an opportunity. I don't see that it's a, it's a challenge, but it's a challenge that calls for an opportunity. We need for B2B to be better communicators. Okay, so it sounds like your philosophy is very much certainly when it comes to Africa, but in general, slash, get get rid of a lot of regulations. Yes. Most regulations are dead weight. Mm-hmm. They're actually counterproductive. Mm-hmm. And coming back to this idea of startup cities, it sounds like these, so from my understanding of them, I'll, I'll explain yeah. and feel free to connect, uh, correct. A startup city would be an area that is built on a greenfield site. Mm-hmm. So it's not building within an... It's not, it's not taking an existing urban area and repurposing it. You're, you're starting a brand new city from scratch, um, including its design, uh, its physical infrastructure, but also its governance in- infrastructure. Presumably, it needs some starting rules and regulations. So what are examples of rules that a, a healthy startup city should have? The best way to think of them is that these are next generation special economic zones with their own law, their own governance, especially when it comes to commercial law. And also that they have custom, uh, that they also have a custom regulatory framework. The reason why um, we go for zones rather than for the whole country at once, because we're we're having some of these conversation with some some nations that are like, if if you're saying that our law are inferior, why are we stay, why are we keeping them? Let's just leapfrog to what you're going to do with us. And problem there is, it's one thing to put the law to say the law is changing, you know, like first of all, when you say which laws have to change and all of that. What people have to understand, because that's what happened when I talk about this, like, my God, so where do we start? Where do we start? We're doing business in rank, index ranking. Where do we start? These 10 indicators and every indicator has sub indicators. Where do we start? I say the problem is it's complicated <laughs> because what it is, is it's not about touching this law, touching that law. It's like you have to have a certain um, t- an amount of um, reforms happening together at the same time for it to all of a sudden make sense. It's almost like, you know, in, in, a, in a Italy right now, they're giving you these homes for the symbolic um, euro because <laughs> all of these villages are emptying themselves. Mm. And, but I'm like, oh, sweet, sweet. But what if you like, you come up, it's, yeah, it's one euro to get it. But, oh, you're going to need, I don't know how much money to renovate the damn place. That's fine. You might say, yeah, I have to renovate. Oh, but once you're done renovating it, uh, the taxes on this home is going to be, I, I'm just making it up, 50%. Or, and, the, and by the way, the way you're going to have to renovate it, it's going to have to be back to standards of back in the days. Meaning you cannot just use whatever you want. You cannot just build it where you want. You have all of these things to happen. And so all of a sudden, that it's one euro, but you're, you're like, no, keep your, keep your thing. Yeah. You know? So that's the same thing. If you come and you say, for example, the, 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 the labor laws, for example, in the labor laws, and you say, okay, my God, we get it. We get it that it's so wrong that uh, right now, in order for you to hire live, you basically have to sign a, pay, uh, a, a contract in three, in three sets. And then you, you, most importantly, you have to bring it physically because our government people don't open their emails. So you have to travel to them. And we're in the countryside. It's two hours, an hour and a half to two hours to get there to take this thing. And there, some government official who has probably never even gone to my village, has never built a business, Gets to let, alone, yeah, let alone work in one business, this person is going to get to decide if Liv and I can work together. 
He's going to be the, he, this is right now, because when I talk about these things, people think I'm talking about crazy stuff like laissez-faire. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm talking about things where a government official gets to tell you, gets to decide if you and me can work together. And then they say, oh, and go to your doctor. Liv, Liv has to go to her doctor and get a certificate to show that she's physically apt to do this job. Oh my God. A desk job? Really? No, but this is rent seeking for the doctors. Right. These, these laws are there. If you try to take it off, guess who's going to be in the streets? Probably them because you're taking away income from them. Mm. And so you can say, but then let's say we, we fix that. Let's say it's all fixed. But at the same time, the tax laws are still so complicated that like it is today, it's truckloads worth of uh, laws, which means it's complicated, which means complicated laws means you're going to make mistakes, honest mistakes. And in this case, honest mistakes tax-wise means you're going to be harassed by the government and or put in jail. So, that, okay, now all of a sudden you said, fine, you and Liv can enter freely into a contract. I don't have to oversee it. Same thing when you fire each other. I don't have to, because that's the same thing. I cannot fire you without the approval of the right. government. And so why would you ever exactly. hire anybody exactly. if he's taking on all this, this exactly. burden? Yeah. But let's say all of that is fixed. But still your tax, your tax code is so complicated, you're going to make mistakes, meaning you're going to be harassed by government or whatever. Meanwhile, the permits, the time it takes to take permits for construction or whatever, it takes forever. All of these things take forever. Do you think that... Um, even though it's now a good thing that I don't have to consult with the government to hire or fire you, uh, that's, that's definitely lighter. But do you think it's still worth it for me to get into business? No. So you see how you have to have a minimum threshold of uh, reforms to happen together at the same time for it to finally be it like... Sounds like click. you need to really just start again. Thank you. You just said it. Start again. But you can't start again at a whole country level. No. Because for good or for bad, there are people there. They're doing what they're doing. So there's the inertia, there's, there's people's inbuilt status quo bias, even the people who are suffering. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They can't imagine you, a better world. Exactly. Yeah. And especially in many cases, you find that you're going to have to go from civil law to common law. Like almost all Francophone African nations are going to have to, are going to have to migrate from civil law to common law because the French forced their colonies to retain civil law even after colonization. It was part of a deal. Can you define very quickly the difference between common law yeah. and civil law? So common law is, um, the best way to think about it is everything is allowed until, until there is a problem, until there is a problem and then it, 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 it's get brought it. up. Where civil law is every, nothing is allowed unless, unless it is specifically allowed. So one comes from an absence of rules and another one comes from an abundance of exactly. rules. Exactly. Yeah. Where here, the absence of rules, eventually some rules are going to start to build, but they're going to be they better rules because they come, yeah, and yeah. they come out of re real re reality. They come out of reality. They're not some like idealized, theoretical thing from mm -hmm. people sitting in an ivory tower figuring it out. Exactly. Yeah. Figuring it out and, and totally missing the mark. So that's why in so many ways you can understand why, um, you know, um, common law is so much better for business than civil law is. Civil law, basically, you have the right to do nothing unless it was specifically told you, you were told that you can. So how can you take, um, how can you innovate within that, mm -hmm. right? Where the other one, innovate all you can, and then we'll, when there is a problem, we'll, we'll educate. So the problem is, um, so a lot, my country, my country is going to have at some point to migrate from civil law to common law Senegal, uh, with uh, many others like that. And so if, because we do know that um, definitely to have, because remember, the goal here is to provide best in class uh, business environment. It's the goal. To nations that don't have it, that's why they are where they are. You can't do it at the nation level because of what we talked about. All the forces against you, including the people themselves who are like, why do I have to change every way from one day to another? And most importantly, especially if you're having to switch from common to civil, from civil to common, um, everything else has to follow. The judges have to follow, the judges have to be trained. They just have to, to, be, to, to, to be brought up to speed in how to educate, you know, the cases because it's radically different from, from the other way. The lawyers, the, your whole legal system, your whole judicial system, everything has to follow. It's not just, I made the, I made the change at the legal level that everything follows. It's going to take time. People have to be tricked trained, they have to understand what's going on, all of that stuff. So you can understand that for all of these reasons, trying to do something like this at the national level, it's almost calling for its own disaster. So that's why you want to start in a very small... You start zone by zone. Yep. So, what, so then what you're saying is you're saying, you're saying, okay, in this country, we know why things are the way they are. And we also know that uh, biz, the, a clean, a, a, a world-class business environment, and by the way, that's the other word, world-class because oftentimes people are like, oh, well, these, SE, these SEZs, special economic zones you're talking about, has been tried many times in Africa and never worked. It never worked. Why? Because 
for it to work, you have to remember that you belong to a global world. And many African SEZs are still running on, on an AD software. AD software in 2024, the people are going to go where there's 2024 software. Right, Sorry. Yeah. So you, go up to, you upgrade your damn software or people are going to leave you behind. And that's exactly what's been happening to us. So basically, that's why I say next generation special academic zones, because people might be confused otherwise. So you say we're going to do it in a zone, at a zone, zone by zone to start with, and ideally Greenfield, mm -hmm. because, because it means there's nobody there, there's no one there, you're not taking away from anybody or anything. And there you say here, we're gonna, we're gonna t this is going to be our chance to do it right. We have a clean canvas to start from, and let's do it right. So what these startup cities are is there on this particular piece of land where the rest of the land is running on the worst software possible when it comes to business environment, here we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna proceed to give them the best in-class business environment. And how, and how is this funded? Privately funded? Yes, because again, markets remain the best. And that's another thing about SEZs as well, spe special economic zones. It is known that the ones that are more or less, uh, that the more private they are and the better they perform. And it makes sense because you're, you're subjected to the forces of a market. It's not like some government that has no accountability, just doing whatever sounds right on in theory and paper, you know, doing it in reality, whatever. So that's the other thing. So these things happen, um, happen privately, but they happen with the government. Right? So you have to, for this to happen, you can't just come to a country and be like, oh, I bought this piece of land, so I'm going to do whatever I want. You can't. It doesn't work like that. Mm. You identify a piece of land. Sometimes the government will be willing to give it to you because many countries like mine, a lot of the land belongs to the government. So they can decide to be like, okay, we're going to try, we're going to do it on this land. If you, if you identify this is the best place to do it and um, it works for us as well, then let's do it here. Or in some of the places you can buy a piece of land somewhere, but you still need to negotiate with the government in order because you, you're talk, we're talking about laws here, right? Right. And so here, um, I'll give you the example. So in this case, for me, my favorite example is Prospera out of Honduras in Roitan, the island of Roitan. And um, full disclosure, I think Prospera is doing such a great job that I, um, I'm actually joining them. And uh, I'm the you know, co-founder of Direct Africa. Prospera Africa. I'm very excited about all of this. But uh, so what, in this case, they bought a piece of land, you know, and it was a more or less like a big resort. It was a big resort that it started off from. And eventually, but with that, uh, way before Prospera happened, way back in the days, we're talking about maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, someone by the name of Octavio Sanchez he was the right hand of a then president of Honduras, um, Harvard lawyer trained, who understood exactly what we understood. Spent a lot of time visiting the SEZs in China, special economic zones in China, spent a lot of time in Dubai, visited a lot of places with his cabinet to kind of have a better understanding, went to Singapore, all of that, tried to really understand what's going on. Because by the way, Everything we're talking about is what Singapore has done, Hong Kong has done, even China has done through its SEZs. Mm. So there's no rocket science here. It's just um, the fact that people don't think about it for Africa just boggles my mind. Um, anyway, so Octavio Sanchez, along with some other people, but he really is one of my key figures for this. Obviously, people like my husband worked on these projects and everything, but all of this came from someone like Octavio Sanchez saying, there's a pattern here. There's a pattern. How can, we, how can we do something similar? And so that's how the ZEDES were decided. ZEDES, I should know the Spanish name, but it's pretty much um, a special economic zone for development economy, but, but in, in Spanish. And so the government of Honduras worked with people like my husband and others to actually establish the ZEDE law, the law of, for these zones. And what they did, I think, is just it's just mind-boggling because so they, they establish the laws where basically you allow for um, a way for these zones to start fresh when it comes to commercial law. See, that's the other thing. You're not touching anything that touches the sovereignty of a nation. You're not touching family law. You're not touching um, criminal law. You're not touching uh, immigration law. You're not touching any of those things. It's really about the business environment, the rules of the games that uh, rule the business, the life of a business. And so that's kind of, so they established the premises for that to be done. And then that's what they called the ZA law. And then from there, different, anybody who wants, basically we said, anybody who wants, who find, find the right type of land in Honduras can apply for a ZA. 
with a government. You apply, you get it, you can go do what you need to do. There, what it allows you to do is to come up with a set of laws that you would think is the best in, in, for a business, business environment. But it still has to adhere, presumably, to a certain subset of government laws, like because it's not like a complete Wild West. Very good question. No, it's not Wild West. And this is another thing that many people don't understand. That's why when I hear some people be like, oh, this is wet dream for uh, libertarians, I'm like, you just don't get it, do you? What it is, is um, for this to work, um, again, remember, we're after the best business environment in the world. And having the best, in this best, oh, the best business environment in the world doesn't mean you get rid of all regulations and all laws. Right. It's all is gone. You it doesn't dump, mean that. You can dump litter no. into the ocean or whatever. No. no, that would be the stupidest thing to do, by right. the way. Because, because it's going to make everyone hate you. Not only everyone hate you, but if you're again, you're thinking about the laws of a market, what you're thinking about is, you see, investment in capital likes nothing less than uncertainty. It doesn't. It doesn't right. like it. It doesn't like what it doesn't know. So you going Wild West, it doesn't know that either. Because it's thinking, oh, if, um, if a dispute happens, what's going to happen to me? Mm. Investment doesn't want that. Capital doesn't want that. Talent so doesn't want that. It's incentivized to so make it nice and... Yes, you're naturally incentivized to be predictable. Um, so you have to do two things. You have to be predictable and you have to be efficient. Predictable, why? Because capital and talent doesn't like, especially capital does not like uncertainty. It does not like if something happens, who are these judges? How do they judge? What's the precedent? All of that stuff. Because the precedent gives you a lot of inter- information and it has to be super efficient. So what it is, is that then what happens is that in the case of Prospera, but really anybody who wants to do this, what you have to do is you have to now start looking around the world at what are, about every single thing. It's almost every single law, you have to start looking about where are the best practices. And so this is why Prospera really at its best is um, um, it's a governance platform, literally, that offers the best in uh, choice for law. So for example, if you are a, um, um, a health company, like you're in the biotech or like you're in the medical device or like some type of health related company, what Prosper has designed is a system where you have a choice of law where you can say, based on the company that I'm operating, you get to choose which OECD law do you want to follow, which one. So you could say, I am going to follow US law. I'm going to follow uh, Jap- Japan law. Mm-hmm. I'm going to follow you know, some EU you know, country law. Or... I decide to choose the Honduran one. Right. You see how Massive it attracts... Massive optionality, totally. It attracts yeah. all of them. Because now they're like, oh, you mean I can run my medical, my biotech company just like if I was in America, which by the way, in this case, I decided was the best right. for, for this type of... for my, my field? You, you mean... It's the dream. Straight from Roy Tan, I can run a company like that? Or, oh... Screw the, um, the one from America. The one uh, we know that uh, for this type of Mexico drugs, is better, yeah, yeah, or for this type of drugs, we know that um, the FDA is uh, causing all types of problems. But we know that uh, Germany, Germany is saying you can do, you, you this is approved. So then you're going to say I'm going to follow German. So Honduras on their own on the doing business index ranking, I think that 140 or 142, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, out of 195 or whatever yeah. the number of countries. Are. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's bad. That's no good. That's bad, right? Yeah. Do you know the Prospera zone? What ranking? No, but I'm going to guess it's like... Nine. Oh, wow. Nine. Okay, I wasn't Top that. 10. Top 10, as Damn. measured by Ernst & Young. It's amazing. It's amazing. So that's what the, star- the startup cities at their best are. And so that's what you're doing. And, um, and that's really pretty much, for me, that's the promise of the bright future for Africa. It's like we get these cities. And, and the beauty here to live is Africa is the poorest region in the world. But we get one of these going. It's over. It's game over. No, I see that because it's like planting a seed. And yes. again, it yes. shows if it, if it actually is prosperous, then yes. people are going to want to emulate that. Yes. So how can the people watching, you know, win winners who are a fan of this podcast, there's a lot of people with a lot of energy for this kind of idea, mm-hmm. this kind of project. What mm-hmm. would you advice for them? How can they get involved? First of all, especially for when it comes to Africa, because that's really what I'm going to speak of mostly. Because I'm, um, I'm the head of global affairs for uh, Prospera Global um, and also co-founder for Prospera um, Africa. So, but when it comes to Africa, I would suggest uh, to people to start, you know, a, 
even if it sounds self-serving, I I did I I wrote this book because I wanted people to understand. So the heart of a cheetah is a good place to start with. So you have a better understanding of the lay of the land, what's going on, what happened, and most importantly, how do we get out of this and the role of a startup city. And I can this. attest, it's a really fun book. Thank it's you so much. Reading. Thank you so much. So I would say start there and then um, also join us. Right now, there are two things I'm doing. Uh, one is just uh, this year, we're creating what we call the African Development Fund for the Startup Cities in Africa. What this is, it's the fund, it's what we call the exploration fund. So this is a fund that's going to allow for more of these explorations to happen because I have a few more countries in the roster that are interested and it's a matter of, you know, talking to them. Because what you have is um, at the bigger level, they're understanding more now the startup cities slash uh, charter cities, what it is. And again, um, good work has been done by everybody in the ecosystem, you know, uh, including people, uh, obviously, the charter, the charter cities industry people, people like Nicholas Enzinger, uh, who has a venture capital firm specifically devoted to investing in companies that are in prosperous zones. Everybody that's uh, interested in that should reach out to me because this is our exploration fund. Like I said, we have a few more countries in the roster that are interested in all of this. Um, and beyond that, obviously, um, yeah, there's going to be investment opportunities in these cities. And again, like I said, remember, everybody, Africa is the youngest population in the world, 19 years old. And by 2050, one quarter of every person walking this earth will be African. So as Noah Smith said it, um, futurism is Afrofuturism. And the sooner you get on, the better it is. And for me, it's also another way to, it's also another way to reconcile the world. It's sort of another way to heal us, to heal each other. Heal the history. Um, to feel, to, yes, to heal the history. And do it in a way where it's not about guilt from here or guilt from there or your ancestors. No, 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 no. You, me, we have no say in what our ancestors have done. You're from England. I'm from Senegal. Um, you know, we have no say in what our ancestors have done. Some of my ancestors, you know, Africans, were selling other Africans. Your ancestors were buying them and all of that was happening, okay? So everywhere you look, there is, there is pinks you can point. You and I have nothing to do with that. There's nothing absolutely we can do about that. And uh, surely the future and the present and the future does, can, does not need you and me sitting here and um, having a misery, right. yes, lamenting about that. But what, the f what today needs and what the future needs is for you and me to hold hands and look forward and work together to change the future. And that, you ask me, we have everything live right now to do that. Everything. It's George Ayite who said the cheetahs, the, the future of Africa, and I would like to argue the future of the world lies on the back of cheetahs. Cheetahs versus hippos. The hippos are these people who are part of a system. They're glued, like the hippo is like, you know, in the water, in the river, and it's like so stuck over there. Aggressive. You know, well. they're aggressive and they're crazy, right? Scary. Yeah, yeah. and they're like, don't and eat they my kill, food. They kill more people, they I think, than pretty much it was. They're the worst. Mosquitoes. No, they're the worst. Of the they're large the animals, they're the most dangerous. They're the most dangerous. So those hippos are over there, they're kind of stuck in their ways and all of that stuff. Cheetahs, have you run, have you seen how cheetahs run? How they hunt? Uh, cheetahs are the fastest land animals, you know, goes from- And they work together. They work together. Mm. A cheetah coalition is a beautiful thing to watch. It's so coordinated. 80% of their action is in preparation and 20% is the run and then they go. It's crazy. I just love cheetahs. They're very efficient. Oh, very efficient. So that's who we are. That's us. The cheetahs are the people who said, we are not going to wait for anyone or anything, especially not government, to get it right. So this is what we all are. You know, you're a cheetah, I'm a cheetah, everybody's a cheetah. And um, we got to find each other. And the good news is only take one to 5% of a population to change the world for good or for bad. That's the promise of it too. So let's find each other and let's, let's join hands. A lot of the groundwork has been done. Poverty truly can be solved in our lifetime because anytime this has been done, it takes less and less time to, to see the, the result. When the first... You know, the ancestors of the startup cities were happening. It was taking 35 years maybe for people to see the, the, to see the difference. Um, Dubai, which went last, um, has, was done in 20 years, I believe. We're talking less than a generation. No Every time, time we do yeah. the African cities ones, maybe 12 to 15 years, we can see the difference. So when I hear people saying, how do we solve uh, poverty? This is how you solve poverty. 
This, but but we're going to have to be radical about this. And if the um, philanthropy world is not getting it because they're designed in a way that they can't uh, address systems, then it's going to be up to the rest of us to design something that can address systems. And this is something that for the longest time thought, folks thought we, we could not do anything about. But now we're proving them is you can do something about it. So, But our world is not designed to, to, to support systems. And as you can hear in what everything I explained, there is nothing like you know, um, uh, colonial about anything I, I, I described. Because the fact that companies uh, have access to better jurisdictions, multinationals, it's known. Multinationals can choose, pick and choose which ones they're going to be ruled by. Now, let's bring it down all the way to the littlest person in the community. And so um, this is pretty much what's there. And I think I know no better, more beautiful way than to finally all of us come together, finally kick poverty down to the down to the, to the curb, because we've got bigger job to do than trying just to sustain people. You know, we have cancer to solve. We have, um, you know, more rockets to send in, in, into the earth. We have uh, more of the diseases to solve. Every one of these Africans is one brain that's going to waste, yeah. as it is right now. It is the most stupid thing that we're doing to ourselves collectively to leave anyone behind leaving such unproductive lives due to poverty. There was a really interesting statistic about actually the most unemployed people in, certainly in some of the Western African nations, are the most educated. The most, yeah, the more educated you are and the more likely you are to not have a job. That's nuts. Think about the waste of this. Yeah. Think about this. It's like so, all this intellectual capital, these brilliant young minds, and they're just sitting there doing it. There's nothing. And they're so frustrated, which yes. then creates conflict. And, yes, yeah. yes. So this is why for me, that's where this whole promise is. I mean, we have such a beautiful world ahead of us, right? I personally, there's no other time I would, I would prefer to be alive. Okay, um, as a black woman uh, evolving in the world, this is the best time to be alive. And I can almost say for sure that I believe it's the same for you, because even if back then maybe you would have been queen or who knows what else, still you would have had to maybe die in childbirth for reasons Sorry. that don't have to be or who knows what else. Today is not the case. So in all metrics, by all metrics, we are living our best lives, our best lives. Let no one tell you otherwise. And we can make it even better by bringing out everybody else with, you know, out of poverty into prosperity. And from there, we all kind of tackle bigger issues. So for me, for me, this is what we should be focused on. Let's all the division go by the sideways. Um, you know, even this stuff, you know, I see people saying, oh, there is a war of, a, there's a civilizational war going on. I know it's very popular to think these things right now, but it's, for me, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Do we have people like the Muslim Brotherhoods who are involved in a civilization war? Yeah. Do we have on the other, on the other end of that, on the other extremes end of that, uh, people you know in the Western world involved in civilization war because they think zero Christian background is the best or whatever for right or for wrong, whatever? Probably. But I like to argue that those are two special, two small factions fighting these weird things. But in between, you just have people like you and me bumbling along, trying to make it as we're going along. That's it. And all we want is for our families to be safe, for our children to be taken care of, and for us to be not being thrown by the, by the sideline when we fall sick or we fall ill or we fall handicapped or whatever. We just want to live. We just want to be. And so for people who are allowing themselves to be distracted by bogus you know, stuff. They sit there and they say there's a civilizational, or when you're being a politician, they think there's a civilizational war. When I'm like, no, all I see is people who are clearly telling you they don't have enough. Whether it's the immigrants that are coming, you know, or the, existing or the, people. Or the people who are here and are telling you, like the, like the yellow vest, we cannot make ends meet. Mm -hmm. And you're talking to me about, about climate change. That's what started the yellow vest. And so these two people have the same problem, which is called poverty. And they have the same solutions as well. But instead of addressing that, we address the consequences. And of course, we go for the easiest um, culprit, which is in this case, skin color is the fast, the quickest things to see. And then beyond that, religion as well. Right. So we go for the easy markers to start to differentiate ourselves and say, this is a reason, like the things that differentiate us. When we need to go back and remember the poverty here and the lack, lack, Lack. 
So the key, the key is to uh, unlock abundance, get rid of scarcity. And yeah. it's we'll find our way back to each other. We will find our way back to each other. So there we go, folks. Thank you so much for listening. And of course, to McGut for this conversation. Do check out her book that's out now, Heart of a Cheetah. Super, super cool. I've also linked below some of the resources that we discussed, including some of her research papers that I'd also really recommend you read. And of course, please like, share, subscribe. You know the drill. Either way, I will see you in a couple of weeks.